If you grind coffee at home, you've probably come across someone on the internet, someone like me, telling you to get a little spray bottle like this and to spray your coffee beans before you grind them. Now, this little hack has been around for a long time and it's often referred to online as the RDT or Ross Droplet Technique. Doing this reduces the static generated when you grind coffee and it makes the whole thing way less messy. A very good reason to use it, I think. But today there is a newly released scientific paper diving into what's going on and they found something we all missed, something that I think is super surprising and extremely interesting. This is the paper. Very kindly, one of the authors, Chris Hendon, who you might be familiar with because he's published papers on coffee stuff before that led to the phenomenon we now know as turbo shots. Well, he shared the paper with me early and gave me a chance to kind of read and digest it. And then I got really lucky because he was passing through London. And so I grabbed my most intellectual turtleneck, grabbed a little studio to borrow, and we sat down and had a conversation about this whole thing too. Please introduce yourself. I'm Christopher Hendon, I'm a professor of chemistry at the University of Oregon. Now the paper is free to read in its entirety, it's not paywalled, and it's linked in the description down below, so I would encourage you to go and read it, but we're gonna cover it in three parts. Firstly, we're gonna talk about why you need to add water in the first place. Secondly, we'll talk about what happens when you add water to your coffee beans before grinding. And then the third part will be this weird little byproduct that it sort of has, this effect it has on coffee brewing and how it might be relevant or even essential depending on you and your setup. Let's get briefly a little bit technical. When you grind coffee, you generate static electricity in two main ways. One way is referred to as triboelectrification and the other way is fractoelectrification. The mechanism of that is basically you can think about it as interfacial heating. Mm -hmm. uh, coffee is no different to other materials in the sense that you're going to rub and break it during the grinding process. And doing that, you're going to create a fair amount of interfacial heat. And so as a result, you're going to get static electricity generated. What you're observing then after it exits the grind chamber is small particles ranging from, I don't know, let's say one micron to a thousand micron that are carrying positive and negative charges. It's effectively when it's being tumbled around in there, it's like rubbing the balloon on the jumper on the hair, right? It's also an, an extra effect of breaking. So this idea of fracturing or fracto electrification is sort of an added example of how you might get interfacial heating and then charging. Now, one of the interesting things from this paper is that they found that coffee was not particularly uniform in the way that it sort of generates a charge and the overall charge generated by grinding that coffee. It might charge overall in a negative way, extremely negative, or maybe a little bit negative or potentially positive. There were some broad correlations, but it was, I think, very difficult to predict if you just gave someone coffee and said, when I grind this, how will it charge? The interesting thing is you can measure it in a few different ways and you can also visualize it quite nicely. One of the things that they did and they shared some footage of is that they set up two plates on the exit chute of a grinder. One will be negatively charged as a plate and one will be positively charged. And as the coffee exits the chute, if it carries a strong charge, it will be attracted to its opposite. So negative particles will flow towards the positive plate and vice versa, positive charges will flow towards the negative plate. For most of us, we've experienced the charged particles in a different sort of way. They have made a terrible mess of our grinders. They've gone and flown out and stuck to things or gone all over the counter. They haven't gone where we wanted them to go. And so getting rid of this static charge has been something of a quest for coffee grinder manufacturers. And so people have found a little hack. They've added water to the beans and discovered that when you do that, you don't get this big mess around the grinder because you're kind of getting rid of the static electricity. Well, what exactly is going on? Water is a, a very good dielectric medium in the sense that it is polar. So the oxygen in water is negatively charged and hydrogens are positively charged, meaning that they can interact with things that are of opposite charges to either of those atoms. And as a result, uh, water is very good at mitigating charging of solutions, uh, evidently during grinding as well. But water also has other properties that are useful for mitigating static accumulation. It's, it's very, very good at dissipating heat. The amount of charge does depend on how high a temperature you go. And so as a result, having water around probably serves multiple roles. On one hand, it's probably changing the surface chemistry of the coffee and also of the burrs. It's probably also cooling the burrs and also cooling the coffee. It's probably acting as a 
sort of an interfacial barrier between any charge that's forming, maybe going into the water rather than accumulating on the coffee, and perhaps other effects as well. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, why do we need a scientific paper about this? I know that adding water to my beans, if I give it a little spray, well, that gets rid of the static and everything is all well and good. Or maybe you've got a grinder with an ionizer and you're like, well, I don't have to worry about this anyway. Is it really worth spending the time and energy and money doing the science here? And on my first read of the paper, by the time I was maybe two thirds of the way through, it kind of maybe felt a little bit the same. And then I hit a fascinating little section all about espresso brewing. You see, they said in their testing that when they did this technique, when they added water to the beans, there was a real change in the way that the espresso brewed afterwards. They saw a dramatic decrease in flow rate and a dramatic increase in extraction. And I thought, hang on, this doesn't track. I've been doing this for ages. I've never seen anything like this in my own experiments. I've never seen any real change in flow rate. And then I had to read the paper again. Read it properly, because this is where it gets interesting. Because they were measuring the charge, they could measure how much water they needed to add to kind of truly neutralize the charge. And they were dosing the water at a much higher level than I had been previously. They had been recommending 20 microliters per gram of coffee. I don't expect you to do the maths right now, but I'll tell you for a, say an 18 gram dose, that's 0.36 grams of water. Still not very much, but if you convert it to spritzes or sprays of water, well, that might be three to four sprays of water for an 18 gram dose. Way more than I was doing. I was doing one spray on the beans. That was enough, little shake in the grinder, on we went. This seemed to suggest that something really interesting was going on here and water was having this whole other effect on espresso brewing that needed to be explored. So the question is gonna be why? Why would adding water change the flow of espresso? And talking to Chris, he had a theory. He suggested that what was happening is that when you're grinding coffee and you're generating all these charged particles, well, they're not all charged the same way. You'll have some positive and some negative. And if you had, say, a large positively charged piece, well, it may well attract a bunch of negatively charged fines that would stick to it to create what he calls an aggregate. And what I'm gonna call an electroclump. Can I, can I call them electroclumps? Electroclumps. Well, they're not electric, they're not electrified anymore. Oh. So you're, you're basically going to say when, when you grind coffee, you produce fines and boulders. Yeah. And if you don't de-electrify, they will exit the grind chamber as an electro clump. Yeah, because that's a specific type of clump. Sounds good to me. Okay, fine. I know it's a stupid word, but I feel like aggregate is also a serious word. And this is, well, this is just much more me. So I'm going to call it an electro clump. He argues that the presence of electro clumps in your portafilter, once you've tamped that coffee down, reduces the evenness of the flow, it reduces the evenness of the bed density, and they're bad. And when you spray water, you prevent the static forming, and it prevents these kind of electro clumps forming, and the fines are kind of free to be evenly distributed in the puck, and therefore you have these slow flow rates and higher contact times, and therefore higher extractions and less channeling too. Seemingly, a total win-win. Now, before we go any further on this, we have to ask a slightly different question because you're probably now thinking the same thing that I was thinking at that point, which is four sprays per dose of beans. That's a lot of water going into the very nice coffee grinder you might've bought and spent potentially a decent amount of money on. Is there a risk here? In our hands, we didn't see a moisture accumulation in our grinder. We did see a change in internal humidity in the grind chamber, but that return to equilibrium, which on the day that we did this was 40%, very rapidly, uh, you know, in, the, in a matter of, let's say, time frame of a minute, rather than waiting a, a long time because there's drips of water in there. We also thought originally that grinding frozen coffee was going to be a problem for our coffee grinders, and we haven't seen any real problem with that. This may prove to be the same, that a small amount of water may dissipate rapidly and we'll never really see an issue. We do need to talk a little bit more, I think towards the end of this video about the potential for you and experimenting with this stuff and how you feel about it and how I feel about that much water going into a grinder because I think it is still an unknown. But for now, I wanna move on to ionizers because 
this is interesting. If you're not familiar with ionizers, well, a number of grinders now have them. Grinders like the Ode Gen 2 or the DF64 Gen 2, or I, I think Akaya sells a standalone ionizer originally designed for its Orbit grinder. They are increasingly popular and I think have come way down in price. And for many manufacturers, they've been a nice way to improve the kind of experience and quality of life of the end user. When a theoretical electro clump forms, it will neutralize any charge that it has. The positive has met the negative, there is no net charge anymore. An ionizer will only work on a charged particle. And so if you have an ionizer or a grinder, theoretically, it shouldn't affect the presence of electro clumps. In the coffee environment, you're gonna point the negative side of the ionizer at, in principle, positively charging coffee, and you're gonna neutralize that charge by bombarding it with negative ions. The problem with that is, is that the de-electrification step there has occurred after the particles have exited the grind chamber and have flown through the chute of your grinder or whatever. And during that time where the coffee is charging whilst grinding and then exiting and falling, the small particles and large particles, which may have opposite charges, do have time to finding each other and form an aggregate. These clumps then are seemingly charge neutral or close to that which means that your ion beam is not going to break apart those clumps. It's just going to minimize charge of other particles that may be charged. So when it comes to a scientific paper like this, one of the first things you're gonna to want to do, or I would wanna do, is see if I could replicate the findings from it. And this is where things got interesting. You see, now, in their paper, they just used one grinder. They used the Malkernig EK43. It's a commercial grinder. It's very popular across the coffee industry. And I guess if you're thinking about the coffee industry, this is a pretty good grinder to pick to do that experiment. Fortunately for me, I have a bunch of other grinders here, because I'm doing a bunch of testing on grinders. And so I wanted to replicate this across different grinders. And this is where things did not go as I expected. I'll talk you through my experiments and my results so far. I'll be honest, I wish I'd had done more testing, had time to do more testing and test more things. I'll share areas where we could collectively do some testing at the end, because I think if you help me, we could learn really fast, really quickly and share that information with everyone. Let's start with the first grinder that I tested. I just did a simple test using a grinder called the DF64. It's the Gen 2, it has an ionizer on it. It's a flatbird grinder and I used it, I dialed in uh, normal beans, dry beans, so to speak, and I pulled a 28 second shot using 18 grams in and about 38 grams out. That's the kind of overall recipe. I then added four spritzes of water to the beans and my resulting shot time went up to about 38 seconds, a dramatic change. So I thought, okay, this is it, this is, this is happening. It just has to be this higher dose of water and you get the benefit and you get the results. But then I tried it with a different flatbird grinder, the Eureka Mignon Oro. Similar burr size, similar RPMs on the grinder, but there I saw no impact on brew time from adding the additional water, like none. Did I see a change in extraction? Maybe, not significant. Uh, yes, there was a small increase, but I'm not sure I would claim it statistically significant. It was much, much smaller as well as an increase compared to the much slower sort of brew time that came with the DF64 Gen 2. This was strange. What exactly was going on here? Here comes a little bit of speculation on my part. As Chris mentioned earlier on, there's these two ways that charges are formed in grinders. There's fractoelectrification and triboelectrification. I would say that the charge from fractoelectrification is probably similar across many grinders, as long as they're producing broadly similar grind profiles. But I think there's gonna be big differences in the triboelectrification piece. Different materials, that would be of grinders or of burrs, will result in different kinds and quantities of charging from triboelectrification. But I also think there's something else at play. If you have a grinder, you may know that some grinders will grind the same speed for say filter coffee at a coarser setting and espresso at a finer setting, while other grinders will take much longer to grind for espresso than they would do for filter. This, I think, is a really potentially important difference. In the one that grinds the same times for both, well, there's no bottleneck in the system at finer grinds. Grounds aren't being stuck in the burrs. They're probably uh, being fed slowly. It might be an auger system or something like that that prevents all the coffee flowing straight into the burrs, getting kind of jammed up there a little bit and kind of slowly getting sort of pushed out and fed through. Where you don't see a bottleneck, I think you just end up generating less charge through triboelectrification. The beans aren't uh, being rolled around, the grounds aren't being rolled around and tumbled and reground potentially. And so in grinders like the Eureka, where 
where the grind time is identical for espresso and for filter, I don't think you saw the same benefits from this thing here. Now, I've tried this across a few different grinders now. I've got half a dozen grinders here at the studio. I don't have enough. And so while this correlation has broadly shown up where, you know, bottlenecked grinders really benefit while grinders that have no bottleneck don't really benefit the same way, I think we need to take this to a wider audience and that includes you. So if you're willing to take part in an experiment, I'd love for you to do this with me. It should be a relatively simple thing to do. Dial in your espresso grinder, if you make espresso, with normal dry beans, no spraying at all. When you're dialed in, measure your brew time for a fixed recipe. Then add the appropriate amount of water to the beans. It's gonna be about three to four sprays if you're using around 18 grams of coffee. Then record the brew time of the spritzed bean shot. It might be the same, it might be very different. There's a Google form linked down below, and it's gonna ask you what make and model of grinder you have. It'll also ask you if you know for sure whether it grinds for espresso slower than filter. If you don't know, just skip this one, it's fine. Then it's gonna ask you for your brew time for dry beans and your brew time for spritzed or RDT'd beans there as well. Now, please, only take part in this experiment if you're comfortable adding that much water to a dose of beans and grinding it. Personally, I don't think on a single use like this, there's any real risk to your grinder, but it's your grinder, it's not my grinder. And so, you know, informed consent is important in all things. There is, I suppose, technically some risk with it. I don't think much, Chris doesn't think much, but I should flag it if I'm gonna ask you to do a thing and experiment that particular way. I'm very much aware that there are still some pretty big unanswered questions that I think are extremely relevant to this paper. One might be, does this impact filter coffee? I don't know. I haven't been able to do the testing where I feel like I can isolate all the variables of the brewing process away from the variable of adding water to the beans before grinding them. But I intend to do more experiments in the future. And if you do some yourself, please share it with all of us. Then I, I think another great question, which I don't have an answer for yet, which is, okay, let's say you add the water to the beans and you get this slower flow rate and you get this higher extraction. Does that taste better? Is that somehow preferable to just having a slightly finer grind and producing the same contact time and the same brew time to, to sort of aim for a similar extraction just using grind rather than using the addition of water? Now, the theory has been that for many grinders, grinding finer can produce lower extractions. You kind of hit a wall where you grind so fine that you get channels and uneven flow. This is extremely relevant to Chris's previous paper that we covered on this channel as well, where he encouraged people to grind coarser and use a sort of longer ratio to hit the same extraction, but doing so, you know, you would have more even flow because very fine grinds produce uneven flow. Is adding water to this a way to have, you know, a bit more range at the finer end of things or, or go that bit finer, have that slower shot still yield very high? Maybe with some grinders, but maybe not with others. That's the kind of thing here. Now, I should add, we have a particle size analyzer now here at the studio. And what was fascinating to me is that the analyzer could see no difference in the grounds from the DF64 that were producing this 28 second shot and this 38 second shot. The distribution was pretty much identical. And in some cases, I saw very small shifts in some grinders towards an overall finer average particle size when I was adding water, but that was not uniform or consistent across every grinder. At this point, I'm unsure if it supports Chris's theory or works against it. Overall, I, I am left, as usual, with more questions than answers. So what's the summary here? I think this is something that is worth experimenting with if you're comfortable experimenting with it. Do you see a change in flow when you add that little bit more water to your beans before grinding? And if you do, is that increase worth it to you? Do you like the taste of it? These are questions that I cannot answer for you. I think this is fascinating research that has opened up a new area of exploration. And, and I think there's tons of stuff we can learn from it and new questions that we can ask from it as well. I'd obviously like to say thank you so much to Chris for sharing the paper ahead of time, sharing his time with us to sit down and chat. It was a very enjoyable conversation. Uh, thank you to his team for sharing resources too. And I really like his approach to doing coffee science that's trying to benefit as many people as possible, keeping the science open and accessible. I think this is a very good thing. But now I wanna hear from you down in the comments below, or don't forget in that Google form where the results will be public. Have you found this to impact the way that you brew coffee? Will you be experimenting with this? Do you wanna try it for filter coffee? And will you share those results with us if you do experiment? I'd love to hear from any and all of you about your thoughts about this paper, thoughts about this whole kind of world of spraying coffee beans. Is it good? Is it bad? Do we need a different solution? 
Let me know your thoughts. But for now, I'll say thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day.